Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you guys to the APAMSA Internal Medicine Boot Camp this year, organized by National APAMSA. My name's Ray. I'm a PGY6 Cardiology Fellow um, at Yale, um, and I work together with Victoria, Ellis, and Jess um, and, and Tori in putting this together. Um, we have a very special treat for you today um, in that we have uh, four excellent, outstanding residents, um, Drs. Arsh Kokar, Ramya Sampas, Sanju Garimela, and Steph Kim, um, who will go over very concise, you know, three to five minute approaches to common issues that you will encounter on your intern year and uh, your sub internship. And you know, we're we're here to help you. We all believe that internal medicine is not impossible to master. It's within your reach, and we want to help you get there. Um, so um, please take this two hours as a, a time for yourself to learn and to prepare for, for your intern year and sub internship. Um, and I'll pass it to um, Jess and Ellis to make a few announcements. Thank you for joining us. Hello everyone, my name is Elise. I'm one of the alumni co-directors along with my co Jess and we wanna welcome you to the 2024 APAMSA Bootcamp Series. Um, today, we will be doing the internal medicine boot camp, as Ray mentioned, by a wonderful four residents. And we have some high yield topics for you all. Today's session will be organized into two parts with a five minute air to mission. Uh, this 2024 APAMSA boot camp series has six sessions. Um, please check out our other sessions coming up later this month in emergency medicine, psychiatry, radiology, and family medicine. And in your chat box today, please feel free to ask questions while the presenting resident speaks. The remaining non-three uh, presenting speakers will answer your questions in the chat box. Also, if you are an audience member and want to answer a question from your peer, please announce your name, school, and year of training. We encourage you to participate and ask questions as well as answer questions. And this alumni bootcamp series would not be possible without our speakers. So please fill out the feedback form. Any feedback, acknowledgement, and or thanks that you have them for have for them would be appreciated. In addition, the national board would love to hear your feedback about the logistics aspects so that we can figure out what people liked or what people want tweaked for next year. And without further ado, I will pass it off to our wonderful speakers. Perfect. Thanks, Elise. Um, my name is Sanju. I am the um, PGY3 at Yale um, doing internal medicine. Um, I'm from Aurora, Colorado, and I went to Colorado for literally everything, undergrad, med school. Um, next year, I'm going to be doing my chief resident year at Yale, and then ultimately, I want to do um, cardiac crit care, so cardiology fellowship and then a crit care fellowship. Outside of work, I like to travel, um, try to get out of New Haven, and then I like to cook and play board games and just hang out with my friends. Hi everyone, I'm Steph. I'm uh, an intern at Yale and in internal medicine in the physician scientist training uh, training program. Um, I'm originally from San Jose, California. I went to University of Michigan for my med school and outside of work, I like playing music um, in the orchestra here. And I'm also a cat mom um, for Cats Piper. She might make an appearance today. Hi everyone, my name is Ramya Sampath. Um, I'm a PGY1 at Yale in internal medicine. Um, my hometown is very close to Steph's um, from Sunnyvale, California. I went to University of Rochester for medical school. And as I mentioned, I'm in the categorical program in internal medicine. I'm interested in cardiology and planning to go into that. Um, and outside of work, I'm a plant mom. Um, I also like to knit and I like to cook and generally just hang out with friends. Hi everyone, my name is Aris. I um, was born and raised in Los Angeles. I went to undergrad at USC in LA, um, did med school at Penn State, um, and I'm a PGY3 in the UIM program here. Um, after this year ends, I'm going to do a cardiology fellowship in Loma Linda in Southern California, um, which I'm super stoked about. Um, outside of work, love anything has to do with sports, field hockey, soccer, basketball, golf. Uh, I'm not particularly good at any of them, but, you know, we try. Yeah, I want to add that these four residents that you're going to hear from today, it's not a random sampling of residents at Yale. These are 
the cream of the crop, people who are very passionate about medical education, who've won teaching awards for medical education, who are designing this session especially for you. So thanks for those introductions. With that, let's start uh, with the first topic. Okay, so um, first I'll be talking about cro uh, common cross covers concerns. Um, this, this talk is meant to give you some kind of go-to orders um, for the most common symptoms you'll be paged about your intern year. Um, I think it's good to just have some PRNs in mind because when you're cross covering, you're usually on night rotation. Um, you're, you just have a lot more patients and it's a lot busier. Um, so I guess like just before I start, I think my general advice for all these is um, when you get paged, before you order anything, um, just be sure to think about like who the patient is and what they're admitted for. Um, and to th think about what symptom they're having, like if, if that's a symptom of a, a more serious underlying condition. Um, but assuming you've assessed the situation, um, these are just an idea of some PRNs you can use. So I'll, I'll start with insomnia, um, extremely common in the hospital. People are in a new environment. Um, they're getting woken up for vitals. Um, I usually like to check the home med to see if, um, you know, there's something that's worked in the past for the patient. Um, but in general, I like melatonin. It's safe. Patients tend to find it effective, um, usually starting from a three to six milligram uh, dose. Um, if you need something different, trazodone also has off-label uses for insomnia, um, usually starting from a 25 to 50 milligram dose. I don't really like to go over 100 because... Um, as you go higher, um, this can tend to have, uh, start to have more of an activating effect. Um, in general, I like to avoid uh, Zolpidem. It's a benzodiazepine uh, receptor agonist, and so it can um, increase risk of things like falls, delirium in patients, um, and diphenhydramine as well, um, unless these happen to be on like what pa the patient takes at home and they absolutely say this is like what works for them. Um, for agitation, um, agitation can mean a lot of different things. So this is one of those things I'll, I'll clarify with the nursing, like what do they mean by a patient is agitated? Um, I'll also go see the patient. Um, usually start with trying to reorient the patient, make sure they're not experiencing delirium or um, things like pain, medication side effects. Um, usually, you know, sometimes it might just help to help them sleep um, or to get them a one-on-one -on -one sitter. Um, but if they become aggressive, you might want to consider antipsychotics like Seroquel or Haldol. Um, these can be QT prolonging, so check their med list and EKG before you order these. Um, otherwise, a benzo like Xanax or Ativan can work, or hydroxyzine if you want to avoid benzos. Um, for nausea, check the QTC again here. Um, most of the go-to medications are QT prolonging. Um, these are things like ondansetron, metoclopramide, prochlorperazine and promethazine. Um, if patients are actively nauseous, I, I would prefer like an IV formulation rather than a PO. Um, and then if you need, Ativan is one of the few antiemetics that won't prolong the QTC again. Um, so um, I guess like for the next slide, there's cough. Um, cough, uh, for, for cough, like you can use cough drops or lozenges, lozenges uh, um, as like cough suppressants. Um, and pill form like benzonitate and dextromethorphan can also work as well. Um, guaifenesin is, is com commonly used in the hospital. This is more of an expectorant and can be a great option for um, people who are feeling very congested, want something to help clear their mucus or their phlegm. Um, for constipation, um, I like to remember mush and push, um, and I, I remind patients, like, it's important for stools to be um, soft enough to be passed, but you also want the drive to, to have that bowel movement. And so usually I'm using a combination of like an osmotic agent like polyethylene glycol once a day with plenty of water and senna once daily as a promotility agent. Um, the next step is to kind of titrate these medications up. Um, but if you really want the patient to have a bowel movement, um, these aren't working. You can use a suppository like bicycodal um, or in more urgent situations um, like an enema with tap water or mineral oil. Um, for patients with diarrhea, um, assuming you've checked that, you know, this is not a new Bristol type seven watery stool, 
um, and you have low suspicion for C. diff overall, you can give them something like a loperamide starting with four milligrams um, and two milligrams after each unformed stool um, without exceeding uh, 16 milligrams a day. Low motile is another option. Um, to be honest, I've never actually used this. Um, this can also have like anticholinergic side effects. Um, so I'll tend to like want to avoid this in geriatric patients. Um, and finally, there's itching. Um, itching, I, th I think, is like kind of difficult to treat, um, but you can try hydroxyzine 25 milligrams or diphenhydramine. Um, both of these are antihistamine agents. Um, and if the itching is localized, you can use topicals like menthol based creams or sarna, uh, like, or, or you can use eucerin to moisturize the skin. Um, next, I'll talk about uh, pain. Um, so usually if a patient is having pain, um, the primary team is aware of it. Um, they'll, they'll give you some recommendations for PRNs. Um, but if you find that the patient is having a localized or MSK based pain, I tend to like um, to start with topicals like diclofenac gel, lidocaine patches, um, really non-pharmacologic interventions like warm or cold compresses. Um, Tylenol is very safe as a PRN. Usually higher doses like 650 or 1000 milligrams are more effective as pain doses. Um, you can use ibuprofen as well, um, but you'll generally want to avoid these in patients with things like AKI on CKD, CAD, heart failure, or GI bleed. Um, as the pain gets more severe, you can consider tramadol or oral opioids like morphine or oxycodone to start. And if the patient is not tolerating PO, um, you can have um, like uh, you can use like IV options like morphine or hydromorphone. Um, you've probably like all learned about the opioid conversion table, um, and I like really like the way uh, Ray organized it here, um, but it illustrates how just different op uh, opioids and PO and IV forms can have different potencies relative to PO morphine. Um, and so uh, the, the PO morphine is traditionally the standard point. Um, I won't go too much into this chart other than to say, um, but just to be like mindful that opioids don't really convert one to one. And if someone is requiring a certain amount of opioids and needs to go up or down in the dosing, um, just try to refer to a table like this to um, kind of guide uh, safe dosing conversions um, and to ensure that the patient is getting the amount of um, appropriate amount of new opioid they need to uh, control their pain, but also avoid overdose. All right, so yeah, that's um, kind of it for cro common cross cover concerns. I'll go into hypotension next. Um, I think it's important I, uh, to, to know how to work up hypotension in the hospital um, and also to triage it um, because sometimes it can be nothing. Sometimes it can get significant very quickly. Um, hypotension has a broad differential diagnosis. And I really like the way um, this figure organizes the, the different ways hypotension can develop from a physiologic standpoint. Um, just to go through it, um, thinking about distributive causes, um, like I guess like just kind of think about the patient. Um, I think thinking about the risk factors will help you um, really put your money on like what you think is going on. And so for distributive causes, you might ask like, does the patient have a known infection? Are they immunocompromised? Do they have known um, adrenal insufficiency or pancreatitis? Um, under hypovolemic causes, you can um, kind of sort of think about, like, consider the losses. Have they been having diarrhea or vomiting that day? Um, are they third spacing? Um, have we been up trading their diuretics? Um, are they NPO for a procedure? Um, do they have any reason to be bleeding? Cardiogenic causes could include things like um, anything that really affects ventricular uh, function, like arrhythmias, decompensated heart failure, um, valvulopathies, and obstructive causes. Um, these are less common, um, but if you have someone who's a high-risk patient, um, maybe they have a malignancy or a post-op, um, or you're um, uh, kind of holding their anticoagulation for any reason, you might think about a PE developing in the hospital. Um, uh, some other causes are tamponade and um, a pneumothorax. Um, so I'll just like walk you through kind of like uh, the steps that I might take and if I get a page that someone is hypotensive. Um, so first I wanna ask, is this blood pressure real? 
um, I'll be asking the nurse to repeat the vitals, like a full set of vitals to see that this is something that's reproducible. Um, I'll also look at the chart to see that the patient's blood pressure is like, is this something that's acute? Is this something where the patient um, is normally hypotensive at baseline and this is just where they live? Um, and so yeah, get the blood pressure, um, use the right size cuff uh, and check heart rate temperature and SpO2. Um, next, I'll go see the patient assess for any signs and symptoms of hypoperfusion on physical exam. And so I think this is an important branch point um, because if a patient is feeling perfectly fine, um, this tells you you have time and, and maybe you can watch and wait or adjust some of their potentially offending meds. Um, but if a patient is having uh, signs of organ hypoperfusion, that requires a more urgent workup. Um, and so the way, way I'll do this is by, you know, I'll, I'll go talk to them, get a sense of how they're mentating. Um, I'm asking if they're feeling lightheaded um, or if they have chest pain, shortness of breath. Um, for physical exam, like getting a sense if they um, are warm versus cold or wet versus dry, checking their extremities for distal pulses and capillary refill. Um, and I think you can also just um, kind of looking at cardiogenic causes, get a sense of their volume status as well um, by checking for um, JVD, pulmonary crackles, um, pitting edema. Um, if resources permit, you can also check their ultrasound for their IVC to check for collapse. Um, next, uh, kind of at the same time, uh, I'm reviewing the chart and thinking about the patient's risk factors. Like, what are they admitted for? Um, did we do something different today in terms of management? And, um, you know, did we remove any new medications? Did we add anything? Is there anything reversible here? Um, you can look at their last echo, which can also get you, uh, give you a sense of the patient's kind of baseline cardiac function. Um, and while you're doing this, you can start thinking about a workup to send. Um, just kind of going through some examples, um, you can get a CBC. This can tell you about anemia, um, or it can suggest an infection if you're seeing a white count. A CMP can tell you about renal function or liver injury. A lactate can um, suggest hy uh, tissue hypoperfusion and will also help you risk stratify a patient. And um, you can get blood cultures or uh, and UA with urine cultures if you're suspecting infection. Um, a cortisol if you're suspecting adrenal insufficiency. Um, you can also get an EKG, tropes, and uh, BNP, which can give you a sense of um, changes, any changes in cardiac function. Um, in terms of imaging, uh, chest x-ray is usually first line for cardiopulmonary pathology. You can consider an echo if you're worried about heart failure or valvular disease um, or tamponade, which would be more of an obstructive cause. Um, if they're having uh, kind of localizing symptoms to the abdomen um, and you're thinking about like obstruction, perforation, or abscess, you can get a CT abdomen pelvis. Um, and if you're um, kind of sus suspecting a PE, um, you, you could get a stat CTA chest. Um, and I guess like while you're doing that workup, you can start thinking about, you know, just making sure you're, the patient is stable, um, beginning with the ABCs, ensuring they have adequate IV access. Um, and just thinking about like, uh, do they need IV fluids? Um, really for hypotension, um, the, the intervention is gonna be targeted to what you think is most likely uh, going on and what's going to address the underlying problem. Um, and so just for example, um, starting antibiotics and infection um, or anticoagulation if the patient has PE. Um, I guess like just, you can also think about like if they have antihypertensives ordered, um, just holding those medications if you, um, you know, while you're uh, acutely like stabilizing um, kind of the acute hypotension. Um, and so, yeah, kind of this is the summary I think like that I um, kind of put together. Um, I think there's a lot of text here. Um, this is uh, not an exhaustive list, um, but I think just the differential, like the, the takeaway is that the differential is broad, um, but the workup will be um, very individualized. And, um, you know, of course, at any point, if you think the patient needs more support, just ask help from your senior rapid response and MICU. Um, Right. Um, hopefully I'm doing okay with time. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do uh, talk about is hypertensive crises. Um, and so start with a scenario. Um, let's say you get paged 
um, that a patient's blood pressure is 180 over 120. Um, the first thing you want to do is to check that the blood pressure is real. Um, specifically, um, you want the patient to be well rested, um, calm, uh, with their back and feet supported on their chair. Um, you want their legs to be uncrossed um, and for their arms to be supported at the level of their heart. Um, and also you don't want them to be like wearing a jacket, the, the cuff should be on their bare arm. And uh, I put this figure here because it kind of just shows how um, really improper technique with any of these variables can add anywhere between like five to 50 milligrams mercury systolic. Um, we define acute severe hypertension as blood pressure greater than or equal to 180 over 120. Um, once you've determined that um, this blood pressure is indeed uh, elevated and reproducible using proper technique, the next step is to determine whether they're experiencing any signs or symptoms of acute target organ damage. Um, this will separate the patients into two groups, those without evidence of acute target organ injury. Um, these are called hypertensive urgencies. And um, these, uh, the other subset will have um, you know, evidence of acute target organ injury, and we call these hypertensive er uh, emergencies. Um, and this distinction is important because um, it risk stratifies the patient and it also guides management. Um, so what can you do to determine if there's acute target organ damage? And these are really any of the micro and ma macro vascular compli complications of severe hypertension um, that I put in the middle column here. Um, you really want to go see the patient and ask, like, what kind of symptoms are they having um, and do a physical exam. And so in terms of like thinking about workup, um, if they're having uh, new neurologic deficits, altered mental status or severe headache, um, you can consider a CT head non-con um, if you're suspecting like an ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke um, or, or hypertensive encephalopathy. Um, if you're if they're having chest pain or shortness of breath, you can order an EKG, tropes, and BNP to look for ACS or acute heart failure. Um, you can get a chest X-ray if you're suspecting flash pulmonary edema, or if you're worried about aortic dissection, you can work that up with a, a stat CTA chest. And if you're looking at the I's and O's and you're um, finding that someone has um, low urine output. Uh, you might think about renal failure, and so you can get a UA and, and a BNP to check for lights and to check for evidence of proteinuria or hematuria. And finally, you can consider like a CBC blood smear, LDH, haptoglobin to work up MAHA if you're if you're worried about um, like bleeding, like fatigue, like pallor. Um, and so for management, um, let's say like you've kind of determined like you've kind of separated people into hypertensive urgency and hypertensive emergency. Um, for patients with hypertensive urgency, um, surprisingly, there's actually like little evidence to support referral to the ED um, or even ICU admission. Um, there's also, uh, it's actually been shown recently that maybe immediate or intensive blood pressure reduction can actually even be harmful in patients. Um, and so in terms of management, uh, you have some time here. Um, so what I would do um, is to repeat the blood pressure after about 20 to 30 minutes of rest to trend it. And in the meantime, you can um, kind of think about addressing any underlying factors that could be contributing to hypertension, um, things that are a little bit more acute and situational like pain, nausea, and anxiety. Um, and if a patient is hypertensive, like still, you can start by reinstituting the patient's home blood pressure medications. Um, re really, the goal is to reduce their blood pressure to below around 160 over 100, but the timeline that you have is over the course of days to weeks. And so um, really, this is turns into like an outpatient thing as well. And so like when you discharge your patients with hypertension uh, and hypertensive urgency, um, you should just make sure to um, like that they have follow up with their PCP within a week or two or so, so that they can repeat the blood pressure in the outpatient setting and um, adjust their medications after that. Um, if someone is having hypertensive emergency, um, then you're doing your ABCs, you're admitting them to the ICU for IV push or drip medications, um, because these are like faster acting, they're easier to titrate. And um, in terms of like blood pressure goals, uh, this will be really, um, 
dependent on the end organs that you suspect are affected. And then uh, the timeline for this is that uh, you want to be able to reduce their blood pressure in the matter of hours. Um, I won't go through this all, but I was thinking that maybe you could, you know, screenshot it for reference or kind of take the references below for, for reading. Um, this was uh, like made by Ray. Um, I think it really nicely shows how the management of hypertensive emergency will really depend on kind of the pattern of target organ injury um, and how they also just have different um, systolic blood pressure goals within like the first hour, within the next two to six hours. Um, and also that they differ in their preferred drugs as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think um, this will be, you know, more relevant in the ICU, um, but it's just good to be aware of this. And um, there are some references uh, below if you want to read more about the guidelines. All righty. Okay, so um, next I'll talk about inpatient insulin. Um, so you'll be... You'll, you'll be uh, admitting patients with diabetes all the time. Um, you're in turn year, and you've probably noticed from your rotations that we're typically starting patients on completely new insulin regimens in the hospital and holding their home meds like metformin. And um, the reason for this is uh, the hospital is, uh, they're really in a different place in the hospital. People are just eating differently. They're moving around less. Um, also, depending on why they're in the hospital, acute illness itself can alt alter uh, someone's uh, glucose metabolism. We can be giving them meds like steroids as well. Um, and so for my goal for this talk is to show you one way to place those initial admission orders for someone who is diabetic. Um, and I'll, this will be kind of with a focus on type 2 diabetes. Uh, this diagram kind of shows in a nutshell what we're trying to achieve in a patient. And so if you look to the left here in purple, um, this illustrates the endogenous insulin levels over the course of a day in a healthy person. And um, as you can probably appreciate, there's a baseline level of insulin that's always maintained. Um, but with meals, insulin levels spike to compensate for the glucose we eat. And um, this helps avoid extremes in our overall glucose levels. And so these are on, on the right side. Um, these are the types of insulin we can use. There are long acting formulations like Dedimir or Glargine that provide a basal level of insulin throughout the day. And um, there are also rapid act acting insulins like Lispro and Aspart that provide coverage for meals. Um, there are also short and intermediate acting um, kind of formulations in between. And generally, in terms of dosing, these different types of insulin, uh, th their timing is different, but they uh, convert one to one in general. Um, so this is kind of one way to go through those uh, admission orders. First, um, calculate the patient's total daily insulin. Uh, there are two ways to do this. One is if they're already on home insulin, to reduce that dose by 25 to 50%. Um, another way is the weight-based dosing method. And for this method, you can take the patient's weight in kilograms and multiply that factor by, um, uh, multiply that by a factor anywhere between 0.3 and one based on the patient's characteristics. Um, and so if a patient is insulin naive, have CKD or, lean, uh, or if they're lean and elderly, you might think about multiplying their weight by 0.3. Um, but if they have more risk factors for hyperglycemia, if they're more uh, like obese infected, maybe we're giving them steroids, you can consider multiplying that by anywhere between 0.5 and 1. Uh, the next step is to take their total daily dose and split it 50-50. 50% of this will go into their basal um, dose, and the other 50% will go into their bolus regimen. Uh, next, divide that bolus regimen by the number of meals they're having. Typically, this is going to be three, and so you would give one-third with breakfast, one-third with lunch, and one-third with dinner. And finally, you can add a correctional insulin sliding scale. Um, I know that this is going to be, this is probably going to be institution dependent, uh, depending on where you go. My uh, previous institution actually chose a sliding scale based on the patient's total daily dose, which is um, a proxy of their insulin sensitivity. Um, but if you are kind of pushed to choose, you can also take the patient characteristics in the um, kind of chart with the weight-based dosing method and start at a low dose um, sliding scale for patients who are more elderly, insulin naive, 
or um, a high, high dose if your um, patient is more insulin resistant. Um, I think if you're uh, uncertain, it's just it's reasonable to start low and, and go up from there. Um, so let's just do an example. Uh, let's say you have a 60 kilogram patient with type two diabetes with the last A1C of 8%. So uh, step one, calculate the total daily dose. So there's 60 kilograms. Um, I would probably multiply this by 0.5 units per kilogram uh, because they're more of an average weight. Um, and this will uh, amount to 30 units of total daily insulin a day. Um, next, I'll split this 50-50. And so 50% will go into a long acting regimen. And so for example, I'll order like 15 units daily of Lantus. Um, and then the other 15 units will be split uh, by three. Uh, so if they're having breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I'll give five units of rapid act acting insulin like Lispro to be given with each meal. And finally, I'll add a correctional sliding scale, um, probably a lower or medium dose in this case, case um, kind of depending on why the patient is, is in the hospital. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the end of this uh, talk. I think, um, you, you will, as you, as you go on, you'll kind of um, get an idea of how to reassess the regimen on a day-to-day -day basis and, and how to make modifications based on that, based on the glucose trends. Um, but hopefully this gives you kind of a good idea of a, of a place to start. All right, so I'll hand it over to Ramya. Perfect, thank you, Steph. That was amazing. Um, Okay, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up by talking about altered mental status. Um, this is going to be one of the most common things that you're paged for that you're gonna admit someone with. Um, so I think just really developing um, a systematic approach to thinking about altered mental status is is very very key. Um, so I've made this diagram, which is kind of an elaboration of a lot of common frameworks that you'll see. Um, the one that I find to be most helpful is MIST, which you may have he heard about this mnemonic before, um, uh, just a way of thinking about altered mental status. Those are the yellow, green, purple, and pink boxes. Um, but then it's also just helpful to have in mind um, some other mimics of, of AMS, as well as situations where you might want to consider other etiologies or situations where you would want to um, favor treatment before going down any diagnostic pathways. So just to go through this in a little bit more detail, Thinking about mimics, um, a patient who at baseline has aphasia or dysarthria and is coming in and, um, and someone may be concerned about altered mental status for that reason, this is why it's very important to have, uh, to, to get a sense of what their baseline is by A, just asking the patient, um, but also asking any people who are present with them, doing some chart review and, and digging to see if this is a prior known deficit that they're coming in with. Additionally, visual and hearing impairment can be something that leads people to think that someone is altered but may not be able to respond necessarily in the way that, that we might expect more commonly. And so being able to assess, does this person need glasses? Does this person need a hearing aid? Do they not have that with them? Um, those can also be um, just really helpful initial questions to prevent you from going down diagnostic pathways that may not be indicated. And then situations where you want to really just do the treatment before before asking too many more questions. Um, situations like hypoglycemia, um, if someone has low blood glucose, that can present like a lot of different things. They can have shaky um, body movements. They can look like they're having a seizure, but in fact, they really just might have a BG of 15. Um, so really just quickly um, checking a point of care glucose can be helpful to rule that out um, and, to, and to help you treat that if necessary. Um, with opioid overdose, um, you really just want to give naloxone and um, not wait for any sort of confirmatory testing. And then if anybody has a low Glasgow coma scale um, concern that they can't protect their airway, this is also a situation where you just want to go ahead and intubate them or give them whatever airway they need um, in order to um, con continue with your workup. Then going into the MIST framework, so the metabolic really thinks about all of the, the things that might be metabolically active. So any sort of electrolyte derangement, whether hyper or hyponatremia, hyper hypochloremia, um, any really all of the things on the BMP that could be deranged and that you might need to address. Um, and then thinking about organ dysfunction, certainly you can pick up several of these items also from the BMP in terms of if they have a very high um, uh, uh, ammonia, or excuse me, a high BUN. 
Um, or if it's a patient with, um, with cirrhosis and you might be suspecting hyperaminemia contributing to encephalopathy, that's something you can also test for. Um, and then of course, hypoxia, hypercarbia, these are both, uh, both common contributors to altered mental status. And you can pick these up on labs as well, um, as well as, um, as well as a pulse ox. And then hypo and hyperthyroidism, even if it's less common than, than the above etiologies in the hospital setting are definitely things that you don't want to miss because you can treat them pretty easily. And then thinking more chronically about causes of altered mental status, we would think about B12 deficiency and thiamine deficiency, particularly in a patient um, who may have a history of um, poor PO intake or alcohol use. Then moving into the infectious category, um, both thinking about infections that can affect the brain parenchyma and the surrounding structures directly, but then also things that are not in the CNS that lead to altered mental status are important to think about. So within the CNS, specifically meningitis and encephalitis, um, but also outside of the CNS, especially in an elderly patient, or a patient who may be prone to deliriogenic complications of infection, things like pneumonia, UTI, or bacteremia. And then thinking about structural, I've also divided this into CNS and extra CNS. I think commonly we think about the structural CNS causes of altered mental status. So these would be things like hemorrhage or mass effect from a tumor, um, some sort of um, epileptic substrate in the brain leading to seizure, some a traumatic brain injury. Less commonly, you're going to see intra-CNS vasculitis, but it's certainly something you can consider if other options have been ruled out. And then I include extra CNS as a structural uh, category because this can also present, especially in elderly patients, um, if you have a very large distended bladder and that is irritating all the surrounding structures, that can also lead to altered mental status, as can constipation. And those are also important to pick up because they're easy to treat. Um, and then thinking about toxins, you see that there are, of course, a variety of etiologies here, um, both thinking about intoxication with a substance, but also withdrawal from substances, which can very commonly be pre precipitated in the hospital. Um, things that you're going to find as being positive on a tox screen are going to be opioids and cannabinoids. Um, though not all cannabinoids are going to be positive on, um, on tox screens, including some of the synthetic cannabinoids. Um, and then tox screen negative um, intoxicants can be uh, things like ketamine. Withdrawal, we may more commonly think about opioid withdrawal, cocaine withdrawal, alcohol withdrawal in a patient with the relevant clinical history. Um, but also we, we can see baclofen withdrawal, gabapentin withdrawal, and, and medication withdrawal in general um, for, for a patient's stable home medications. Um, sometimes we will dose reduce them or just take them off entirely when someone comes in, and that's something to look at when you're going through the differential for altered mental status. And then, of course, any sort of toxic ingestion, like the methylene glycols of the world, um, if a patient has recently had anesthesia for a procedure and now they're having lingering complications, of course, that can certainly present in that page that you get at 2 p.m., you know, why is a person confused? Um, and then, of course, a direct medication effect, even if it's not, of course, it's not intended to produce the altered mental status, can result in that. Um, so just being able to scrutinize the list of medications, especially things that you may have newly started um, or things that may be interacting with something that you newly started. And then going through this other category, pain itself, not just withdrawal from opioids, but of course, pain itself um, that is untreated can lead to altered mental status, delirium as kind of a category of exclusion, but something that is extremely common in the hospital um, that you that you want to be mindful of and make sure to take the necessary precautions around. Um, as Steph mentioned, insomnia can certainly, um, is, is very common in the hospital and can definitely produce what appears to be an altered mental status. We don't as often see a primary psychiatric condition in, in internal medicine necessarily, but especially in the per, in a person who may have a psychiatric history, this is something you certainly don't want to um, neglect to consider. And then also, as Steph mentioned, um, both hypotension and hypertension can, can lead to altered mental status and um, visual and hearing impairment, I include this um, one here because in addition to being a mimic of altered mental status can also produce that, in, especially in an elderly patient who may then be even more disoriented because they lack the, 
the right faculties to be able to orient themselves. So that was a whirlwind tour of altered mental status. Um, next, we are going to embark on four topics that are more psychosocially focused in terms of thinking about communication with patients in the hospital, as well as with other team members in the hospital. So the first one we're going to talk about is um, the approach to a patient who is wanting to leave against medical advice. Um, and so as you may soon experience um, at 2 a.m., you might get a page that says, Mr. J put his clothes on and ripped out his IV. He says he's fed up and he wants to leave. This is um, sometimes a dreaded thing to happen. It's something that we uh, certainly don't want to happen, but when it does happen, and invariably you will have a patient who wants to leave for whatever reason, um, I think it's it's not too complicated to think about how to take a step back and, um, and have a systematic approach also for dealing with this situation. So um, I think the first thing is to take a deep breath um, it, it can be really stressful seeming, it can feel really stressful to be presented with this, but ultimately the goal here is to try to ensure as safe a possible situation for everyone. And so the first thing you can do is just center yourself and take a deep breath. The second thing is when you arrive on the scene, you may be the primary provider from, you know, for multiple days if it's during the daytime and that's your patient. Or you might be someone cross covering at night and you may not know this person at all. And I think in all cases, the one of the most useful things you can do is just approach the patient with a sense of calm and, you know, really set the tone that this does not have to be an adversarial situation um, and try to establish rapport by asking, you know, what's going on for them? Do they have an untreated symptom? Are they in significant pain and they feel that they're not getting the care they need? Do they have some situation at home that they are thinking about, but they haven't shared and they're trying to leave to go deal with that? Like, do they have a cat? Do they have a dog that they're worried about? Do they have a kid at home that they don't have care for? Is there some aspect of the patient's care so far that has really rubbed them the wrong way that you need to talk about? Um, and, and also something that we sometimes miss and is really easy to address is, are they withdrawing from a substance? Like we talked about an altered mental status. Is, is this something where they feel like they, they want to leave and they, they want to get access to the substance? And that's really what's driving this. Um, then after you've kind of gone through this elaborate sequence of questions, um, being able to explain why you think they should stay. Um, because in all situations, if they're leaving AMA, then presumably the plan, the team had not planned on it. You know, why had the team not planned to let them go? Was there pending tests that they needed to have? Was there treatment that they have not yet completed? And, and being able to explain, you know, this is exactly why we think you shouldn't leave. These are the risks that are associated with you leaving. And these are the benefits that we anticipate. Always this risks benefit discussion. If, if they still insist on leaving, and this is, you know, something that you that you really can't kind of talk them out of or, or bring them to a different kind of course of decision to say, well, what about if we can complete this test and then reevaluate tomorrow? Um, then, then I think it's really important to have them be able to articulate the rationale that you just articulated. You know, what are the risks that you think you will face if you go home? Can you share back with me the things that you understand from what I've shared with you about the risks and the benefits of this situation. Um, and, and then still, you know, always trying to employ a harm reduction approach to this. If they really are insisting on leaving, you still want to do what you can to ensure as safe a possible discharge. So just because they're leaving before, before it's the time that you think they should leave, that doesn't mean that we're sort of absolved of the responsibility to try to make sure that they have all access to their meds at home, that they have follow-up appointments scheduled. Um, if someone's trying to leave, then maybe it's our role then to say, okay, well, let's try to get a sooner PCP follow-up. Um, knowing that you still want them to stay. And then I think it's also really relevant to think about what the clinical situation is. Is this someone who's on day four of five of community acquired pneumonia treatment and the reason they wanna leave is you know they're not sleeping in the hospital and otherwise they're kind of well? Maybe you maybe you decide, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna transition you to oral antibiotics. I'm gonna give you some uh, appointments to follow up on and I don't have to make this an AMA discharge. But you might also be in a situation where there's a patient who just came in with um, 
you know, for it, for acute coronary syndrome. And we haven't completed the workup. We haven't completed any treatment. They haven't gotten any cardiac cath. They just started on heparin, maybe got some meds, and now they're pain-free and they want to leave. You may not feel comfortable saying it's okay for you to leave. And, and that's, that's okay too. Um, I bring this up to say that you don't have to discharge all patients AMA um, because that is a designation that is now in their chart. But if you feel that it is not medically indicated in under any situation for them to leave, then it is certainly within your right to discharge them AMA. Um, and just sort of being mindful about when are we employing which, um, because Discharging a patient AMA is not something that we know improves outcomes for anybody. Um, it's not something that that improves trust in the hospital system. And so I think um, it's also within your purview to be choosy about if a patient wants to leave at 2 a.m., does that need to be an AMA discharge or does it need to just be a discharge that was unplanned and before its time? Um, so I've also included this big flow chart. Flow chart um, I put in this little camera icon to indicate if you want to take a snapshot of, um, of this in case this is helpful, it just kind of walks through all of the um, all of the logic that we talked about before. Um, and one thing I just want to point out on this diagram, they have um, very clearly made um, room for asking, does this patient have decision making capacity or not? This is a very this is a very important aspect to this because you might really not even be able to discharge the patient. AMA or not, because they may not even have capacity to be able to refuse care. Um, in those situations, um, often your the team that's signing out to you will maybe have a heads up that this patient has tried to elope or something, and this patient can't leave AMA, and you might get a sign out that says, patient does not have decision-making capacity to leave AMA, and they'll give you kind of a decision tree of actions on the basis of that. Um, so everything that we talked about before is kind of in the situation that the patient does have capacity. And if they don't, then, then you have to keep them in the hospital. Um, okay, so that's it for AMA. Um, next, we're gonna talk about how to ask about code status. Um, this is something that is relevant for every single patient that comes into the hospital of all ages. Um, the number one thing I would say is we are going to default to, at, to having everyone be full code in emergent situations where we don't have the time to elicit what their preference are, preferences are, where we can't find out what previously stated preferences are. And so, you know, the person who comes in from a trauma and they are unidentified and we have no bracelets or anything, that person is going to be full code for the purpose of our acute stabilization. But otherwise, presuming that you, you know, get an admission and they're in the ED, um, General tips that I have about this are, one, to ask this of every patient to just make sure that you really know and are not assuming what they want of their care. And then to really to normalize this discussion, as I'm sure you've all received um, guidance to do, making, making sure they know that this is a conversation that's not born of their particular illness or situation, but is relevant for every patient. Um, you can try in these initial conversations to assess the extent of the prior conversations they've had. For example, when you bring up the code status discussion, you can say, I'll give you some sample language in a bit, but you can say, you know, has anyone ever talked to you about your preferences for emergent situations? Um, have you ever heard of the term code status? Have you ever heard of, um, of what it means to be full code. You can just generally assess kind of what is their background knowledge and understanding of these terms. And then I think it's very important to be specific about specific interventions. Um, and, and we'll talk more about language for that, but not just assuming that everybody knows what CPR entails or what intubation entails. And then also sharing that this conversation can always be revisited you don't have to make a final decision now. It can be something that you decide on now, and then we can change it tomorrow when I come see you again. So um, just setting the scene for how to start this conversation, um, it can be obviously hard in chaotic environments to, to be able to create um, you know, a great space for a goals of care discussion, but but the code status discussion is usually something that can be done really quickly. Um, I would suggest starting off with some kind of a prefacing statement that gives a lot of the background that I shared already, saying something like, while we hope that your hospital course will be uneventful, I'd like to ask you about your preferences if you were to become unable to make decisions for yourself. This is something I ask all of my patients when they come into the hospital. 
And then getting into the specific interventions like CPR, um, I find it really valuable to use language that highlights what these interventions entail. So for CPR, saying something like, if your heart were to stop, would you want us to perform chest compressions and electric shocks to try to restart the heart? This is important because not everybody has a vision of what CPR is. Um, most, most people, as you may know, um, commonly assume that it's like what they see on TV, that you know you, you do chest compressions and then someone gets revived, um, when the reality is, um, as we know, that I think less than 20% of in-hospital, um, actually substantial, I think maybe less than 15% of people in the hospital are successfully um, resuscitated after CPR. Um, and so this is this is a very relevant point and being able and willing to clarify what CPR involves is really important. And then thinking about intubation similarly, um, it's it's not sufficient to just say, would you want to be hooked up to a breathing machine because there are many kinds of breathing machines that 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 may accord with different kinds of clinical realities like CPAP or BiPAP. So I think being specific and saying, if you were unable to breathe on your own, would you want us to place a tube into your throat to connect you to a ventilator to help you breathe? Sometimes I think, especially as an early intern, it felt like, oh, this is like very aggressive language. I don't know, this sounds scary, but I don't, I, I think it's important to not think of it as scary when we know that these are the realities. And, and some people may say, yes, I do want that because I do want to have every chance to come back. And some people may hear that and think, oh, well, that's really very different from what I imagined and I need to think about it. Um, and then this is just another um, screenshot page. Um, I just wanted to go through this to say that there are a lot of different varieties of kinds of code statuses that people can have. Um, it's not just full code or DNR, DNI. Um, so full code means, of course, that if it were indicated, you would do CPR, you would intubate, you would do everything. Um, but there are also other options such as DNR and comprehensive care, which means that they would not receive um, chest compressions and electric shocks and CPR overall, but they would be able to be intubated and all other therapeutic modalities would be offered as well. And then there is also the option of DNR, DNI, and comprehensive care, which means that they do not want to be intubated, they do not want to be resuscitated via CPR, but they may be open to pressors, they may be open to non-invasive positive, positive pressure ventilation and a whole host of other therapies. And then there's DNR and comfort measures. And that means that we have now reoriented the goals of care to be around the patient's comfort. Often this means we're going to take away all blood draws like routine lab sticks. We're going to no longer monitor vital signs. Um, and this, this is usually done in a staged approach. Um, but I wanted to clarify this because it's not the case that you know just saying I don't wanna do CPR means that your comfort measures. Um, there's really a whole host of options. I think it's also important to note that there is not a viable option of receiving CPR without intubation. Um, because often after receiving CPR, the patient will need to be intubated to protect their airway, especially if their um, neurologic status has been compromised. And so um, I think this is really important to clarify because patients will sometimes come into the hospital and say, you know what, I do want CPR, I wanna be revived, but I don't want a tube down my throat. And um, I think it's really important to just clarify that this is this is not a medically viable option. Um, okay, and then thinking about how do we communicate with colleagues, um, I'm going to be talking about calling a consult. So you may be familiar with the 5C guide to calling consults, and at this point in your training, you probably have called consults. Um, sometimes this can be really fun, and your consultant will teach you a lot of things, and sometimes this can be really scary, and your consultant um, will leave some room for um, better communication. So um, I think that some of these tips can can just smooth the path to an, to a smooth consult. Um, the goal in calling a consult is to involve the, the specialty of interest with a specific question to guide the inquiry. Um, the goal is not to call cardiology and say, I don't know, this seems cardiac. Um, and that's often where a lot of confusion comes in, um, whether because we've poorly formed the question or we're not exactly sure where, why we're calling the consultant. So 
Um, I have some tips on the next slide, but the number one tip I would have is just to really be clear about why are you calling the consult? What is the specific question? Um, and then thinking about exactly how do you structure the consult, starting with um, your name, saying this is who I am, this is um, this is the service I'm on, I'm I'm on the the primary team, and then confirming who the consultant is who has called you. Um, this is important because when you're an intern getting uh, five calls back from different consultants and you start telling the orthopedic surgeon about you know the infectious disease history. It gets confusing. And so being able to clarify, you know, who is the person I'm talking to? Then what you really want to communicate to the consultant is um, the patient's name, the MRN, and what you suspect to be the, the diagnosis that has that has kept them in the hospital that you're treating them for. Concise history, pertinent findings that are relevant to that consultant in particular. Um, do, did you hear a new murmur? and you're calling cardiology, then you probably want to tell the cardiology consultant that information. Um, telling them relevant labs and studies and anything that you've done so far just to guide you know, what they will think about doing next. And then thinking about this core question, um, this, is, this is something that as this chart points out, you, you will want to clarify what's the time frame of need? Is this someone you're very acutely worried about and you really need this consultant to come see them immediately? Um, is this someone that you think is is stable for now, but you have um, you have a question that's going to guide management later in the hospital course? Giving your consultant that information will help them in their workflow, but then also in terms of coming up with a plan for you. Depending on how long the previous information is, the you know patient's name, diagnosis, history, all of that, I will sometimes state my core question before I give them all of that background, just to help reframe their thinking around the question. Um, if if this is a patient that you know doesn't have a very lengthy uh, history in the hospital, then I might just give them that information and then go to my question. <clears throat> um, and so then I'm just going to go through this this um, this paragraph here, and and we can kind of break it down. So hello, my name is Ramya Sampath. I'm um, a PGY1 uh, working with Dr. Smith in the ED. Um, I wanted to tell you about Ms. Doe, a 24-year-old female who presented with an acute asthma exacerbation. She has a history of asthma and shortness of breath and cough for the last week. And on exam, she began to have diffuse bilateral expiratory wheezes. We began treatment with an albuterol nebulizer and oral steroids. Can you evaluate her within the next hour for admission and continued asthma treatment? So this is a situation where the ED person is obviously asking the hospital medicine person to evaluate the patient for admission, um, but gives a specific time frame of concern, gives a specific question around what, what are you asking the person to comment on? Um, and, uh, and, and further, you know, what have you found so far so that the consultant is not just kind of replicating the work that you're doing? And then being able to say, um, sure, I will obtain a chest x-ray to look for infection. If that's what they suggest to you, they might say, okay, why don't you give them, you know, 40 milligrams of prednisone and get a chest x-ray um, and being able to do that and make sure that's available for them. Um, then going on to these general tips, um, we, we went through a lot of these things, um, Sometimes you can be in the tough situation of your team has just suggested calling a consult, but you're not exactly sure why. Um, this is very common, and um, I would encourage you to just be sure to talk to your resident or your um, attending or whoever you feel comfortable with to just say, hey, just before I call this person, I just want to make sure that I really have a clear sense of exactly what it is that we're asking about. Um, and then thinking about if there's workup that you know that the consultant is going to want to have, for example, with this asthma exacerbation person, if you suspect an asthma exacerbation and you haven't gotten a chest x-ray yet, but you're calling a consultant, make sure to get a chest x-ray since you know that they're likely going to want to see one. Um, make sure that you have up-to-date labs, um, things that are sort of basic that are going to prime your thinking as well as your consult consultant's thinking. Um, and then tips for while well, you're actually calling the consult, I think it's always helpful to have your um, medical record open so that you can quickly look for information. Um, oh, and um, 
yeah. And just, just to remember that this is also part of a team sport. It doesn't have to be stressful. Um, and being able to just, um, kind of have the information and, um, being able to follow up, follow up with your consultant afterwards, um, can, can be really meaningful for your learning as well. Okay. And then we're going to talk about giving effective sign out. So again, uh, communicating with our colleagues. Um, so this is also a helpful mnemonic. It's called IPASS, um, and it just kind of goes through all of the steps of what an effective sign out looks like. To start off, I want to say that it is often that we are working in very busy and scattered and, um, and chaotic environments. And this is um, a potentially significant distractor and um, something that can really compromise a good sign out. So I really encourage you to, um, if you are in a really loud room, it's absolutely fine to find a quiet place and say, hey, can we go sign out in this quieter environment? Or if that's the only place you can sign out, it's very fine for you to, to say to your colleagues, hey, I'm really sorry, do you mind um, do you mind quieting down a little bit because I I really like to hear about the sign out. Um, this is this is really critical because we know that sign out is one of the times where things get dropped, things get missed, and patient care becomes compromised. So going through this framework, um, one is I thinking about illness severity. This is where you're going to give the person you're signing out to a sense of how sick is this person? Are they stable? Are they a watcher? Are they unstable? Then the patient summary, this is going to be, you know, your one liner with what is this person here for? Um, what has led up to their admission? What's happened so far in the hospital? What, what's your assessment of what's happening so far? And, and what is the overall plan? And what are they, what are they doing essentially in the hospital so far? Um, this is where uh, instead of presenting the entire list of someone's past medical history, I think it's valuable to present what are the most active issues? Um, so, you know, a patient may have 15 medical issues, but only three of them are active. So you can say this person has hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and heart failure exacerbation. Um, then the action list. This is the to-do list um, for, the, for the person that you're signing out to. Normally, this, I mean, this whole framework is thinking about you as the day team signing out to the night team um, or signing out to the next person who's going to need to complete tasks. And so being clear to enumerate what are the tasks that you want them to follow up on. Then with the situation awareness and contingency planning, um, this is not always relevant for every patient in the sense that not everybody has a lot of things going on, things that are up in the air, but but when they do, it's really important to be able to communicate that to the night team. Um, so for example, we talked about AMA discharges. If you have a concern that a patient is going to um, want to leave, then this is, an, this is a good place to say, to say this to the team, to say, FYI, you know, I prepped this person's medications list in case they want to leave. Um, and this is who you call. This is who you talk to. Um, and then allowing space for synthesis by the receiver, especially for particularly complex patients, um, where you can re where you can have them restate what actions, uh, ask questions about anything that comes up. So going through that, um, this is just a sample patient I came up with. Um, so this is our sickest patient. He's a watcher and he's full code. Mr. W is a 47-year-old male with alcoholic cirrhosis and hypertension presenting with a GI bleed and encephalopathy. He came to the ED with hematemesis and was found to have a hemoglobin of six, received one unit of packed red blood cells and was planned for a scope with GI tomorrow in the morning and his vitals have been stable. Um, tonight, I'd like to ask that you follow up on an 8 p.m. CBC. You can transfuse him again if his hemoglobin is less than seven and he has an active type and screen already and two large bore IVs. In case he has any further hematemesis, you can call the GI fellow, they're on board, they're aware. His healthcare proxy is his wife, whose number is in the chart. And what questions do you have? And so basically this is just kind of um, a way to get through all of the information, but in a really, in a really streamlined way. Um, okay, so I think we are now at our intermission, which will be a five minute break. And then we'll come back for more.
Hey, Elise, is this a little better? I know we were having sound issues before. Sounds great. Okay, thank you. All right, everyone, we are going to start back up um, and I'm going to start off with GI bleed. So we're taking a little twist um, to the digestive system. Um, you are all likely familiar with um, some ways of thinking about how to identify the cause of bleed. Um, you may remember that the way that we commonly localize the cause of bleed is with the ligament of trites. Um, to differentiate between what is likely an upper GI cause versus what is a lower GI cause. 
Um, we sometimes also use just visual examination to think about this. So if someone is vomiting blood, um, if someone has hematemesis, you are more thinking upper GI as a cause. Um, if someone has a dark tarry stool, you're more likely thinking of an upper GI bleed. Um, whereas if someone is having frank red blood um, per rectum or frank red blood in the toilet or, or around the stool, you're more thinking about a lower GI cause. But this is not necessarily um, a very specific way of thinking about it, just because, for example, if an upper GI bleed is very brisk, um, then you can have bright red blood in the rectum because it's just a very fast bleed. Um, so, But those are still helpful ways in general to, to think about localizing. So going more specifically into upper um, GI bleed, so these are going to be anything that's causing damage to the GI tract above the ligament of trites. So whether this is um, the esophagus because of erosive esophagitis or very bad GERD, um, or whether it's um, peptic ulcer disease um, or, or ulcer disease that is um, even just creeping up into the esophagus. So anything that's causing direct damage. Um, and then particularly in patients um, with cirrhosis, which um, Arsh will talk about a lot coming up next, um, thinking about varices um, as well as arteriovenous malformations that can really take place anywhere in the GI tract, um, thinking about gastritis or gastric cancer, um, any sort of malignancy that is occupying space in the upper GI tract can cause a bleed in this way. Um, and then any other cause of coagulopathy that leads to um, that leads to um, inappropriate bleeding from mucosal services that may not normally bleed if you were not coagulopathic, so like hemophilia. Um, and then thinking about lower GI causes, these are going to be things like diverticulosis. Um, again, any um, any sort of um, malignancy like a colon cancer, um, intestinal ischemia and hemorrhoids, um, but then also things like ulcerative colitis, um, Crohn's, um, and then of course, as you know, Crohn's can, can be anywhere um, along the tract, um, but more commonly, we're going to see it there. Patterns to think about on testing um, that can kind of clue you in that you might be dealing with a bleed would be um, on your BMP, seeing a BUN to creatinine ratio that's greater than 36, that really suggests that there's like an inappropriate source of, um, of nitrogen that the body is, is like it's not coming from um, a kidney injury because then you would expect the creatinine to also be really high. So that can kind of clue you in that you've got a um, too much red blood cells in the digestive tract. Um, having 50 to 60 cc's of blood persisting up to a week that's that's in the stool, um, this is, you know, something that's really going to point you towards there's something oozing, there's something that's actively bleeding that we need to treat. Hyperactive bowel sounds, again, not specific for a GI bleed, but is something that in the right clinical context might lead you more towards thinking that you have that you're dealing with a bleed. And then absolutely, if you have a patient with an NG tube and you have aspirate that comes out of the tube that has blood in it, then you're going to be very suspicious about that. Um, I, I, uh, we wanted to share these pictures with you because these are not often things that we see um, very clearly. And so just being able to see the difference between melana and hematochesia. Melana, as you can see on the left, is really this tarry, um, like almost sticky, dark um, substance. Um, it doesn't always look like this, especially if it's not like a very pronounced uh, lower, um, excuse me, upper GI bleed, um, but, but it can. Otherwise we're looking for dark stool. Not every dark stool is bloody stool, but, but dark stool certainly is a good place to start. Um, and then hematochesia, this is where you have frank blood. And so as you can see, you have red color in, in the bowl. Um, if, if a patient tells you that they're wiping blood when they're going to the bathroom, um, if you're seeing spotting of blood anywhere, these are, these are going to be clues for you. Um, and then thinking about what do we do about it? Um, as you may already know, we're, we're favoring thinking about stabilizing first before anything, then diagnostics through scoping, um, and then ways to stop the bleed as treatment. So the first thing you're going to do is um, ensuring that you have access 
uh, access maintained through two large bore IVs. And the reason for this is that the larger the bore, the lower the resistance. And so um, it's a much it's a much easier way to get a massive amount of blood into someone if you need to initiate that massive transfusion protocol. Um, you're, you're going to, along with that, with resuscitation, you're going to likely give blood products if you have an active GI bleed, um, but you're also likely going to give IV fluids. You're going to make sure that you have a type and screen active. Um, and I believe it's every 72 hours that, that you need to ensure that you have an active type and screen. And this is an order that you place in the, in the medical record. Um, you're, you're typically going to order a unit of red blood cells, um, essentially if the hemoglobin drops below seven. And so we're typically targeting above a hemoglobin of seven um, in, in many patients, though there are particular conditions in which you will want to target a higher hemoglobin goal. So for example, a patient with an active um, concern for cardiac ischemia, ischemia, if they also have a GI bleed, then you're, then you're typically gonna target a higher hemoglobin goal. Um, but also if a patient is symptomatic from their GI bleed, you're not going to just wait for them to get to seven. If they if they usually live around 14 and now they're at 10 and they're lightheaded, then you're probably just going to give them blood. Um, and then if indicated, if they're hypotensive um, and you're not able to stabilize them with these with these measures, then, then you might start pressors as well. When we think about starting antibiotics is particularly for patients with cirrhosis, um, patients with a variceal bleed, um, the standard thing that we do is we start ceftriaxone. Um, this is not something that has been shown to improve mortality, but it has been shown to reduce the rate of bacterial infection in patients um, with cirrhosis with um, with GI bleed. Um, and, so, and so that's why we do that. And then octreotide is something that we give to, if you remember what somatostatin does, um, splanchnic vasoconstriction. So if someone is having an active variceal bleed, then you want to really clamp down all of those vessels and make sure that not as much blood is leaving through them. Um, and then and then IV PPI, um, we give really for two reasons. One is to um, reduce the acidic content of the stomach and to promote healing by 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 changing that acidic environment, promoting mucosal healing, but also, um, especially if there's concern for bleed in the stomach, we um, we also want to not lower the pH so much in that environment and thereby inactivate the clotting factors um, and, and make the risk of bleed even higher for that reason. Um, and then thinking about the diagnostics, um, Usually these are going to be selected by your consultant who you will have called and given a wonderful um, consult to. Um, but generally, um, I'm just going to go through some of the options that that GI um, might think about in terms of how to how to localize the bleed. Um, and EGD, um, as is indicated by the name, is really going through the mouth and is looking basically as far as the first third of the of the small bowel. Um, this does not require prep the way that a colonoscopy does. And so depending on where the location of the bleed is, that may be the the um, the therapy that's suggested. A flex sigmoidoscopy is um, is through the rectum. It really only looks at the lower one third of the colon and the rectum. And so if that's where you're very confident that the bleed is, then that then that's a really great option because it doesn't require any sort of um, colonic prep like the giant jugs of uh, Miralax and Golightly that people have to have to consume. Um, but colonoscopy really is the is the option that lets you see most of the bowel. And so again, these are options that are going to be um, chosen likely by your by your gastroenterologist colleague, but um, but just so that you know why you would choose one or the other. And then again, thinking about stopping the bleed, these are going to be things again that are going to be led by GI. But um, depending on what the etiology of the bleed is, for example, if it's a if it's a varix, then you're going to want to try to um, band the varix to to promote the bleed to stop. Um, and this is going to be something that that you will likely do in collaboration with interventional radiology. Um, and um, other other options can be epinephrine, which can can basically stanch the bleeding locally and promote um, vasoconstriction locally. Um, thermocoagulation and clipping are, again, advanced GI endoscopy techniques, so I'm not going to really talk about that, but just so that you know that there are options on the table for, um, for how to think about stopping a bleed.
Um, and with that, I will pass it off to Arsh. What's up, guys? Um, we're going to start with a few different topics, starting with uh, decomplicated cirrhosis. Um, before I start getting to like the, the nitty gritty about cirrhosis, I like to start kind of broad, um, like what is cirrhosis in the first place? NIH kind of defines it as a histological diagnosis, actually. Um, and it's basically when you take healthy tissue that um, and you replace it with like unhealthy tissue that doesn't work normally. Um, this can be caused by you know many different things, including infection like Hep C, Hep B, alcohol, metabolic syndrome, uh, which we know as NASH, autoimmune diseases, um, as well as infiltrative diseases like metachromatosis um, or um, copper overload as well. Um, on the right, you can kind of see like healthy tissue versus not healthy liver tissue. Um, and you really like notice the like disruption of kind of these, hopefully you guys can see my pointer, but um, these like little vacuoles of area that are basically like your vena, like your bi-portal veto system. So your portal system, your systemic venous system, as well as your arterial system. And that really get destroyed in this like unhealthy system, which is like replaced by like fibrous tissue. Um, so you can see that with when this happens that you just don't have a normally functioning liver because the tissue that normally is there isn't there anymore. Um, when that happens, we get into problems. Uh, these problems I break down into like four sort of disease states. Um, and it's, there's a cool mnemonic that I learned uh, from my first senior when I was an intern. Um, and it's like, what do you have? Um, and I break this in down to hepatocellular carcinoma, ascites, varices, and encephalopathy. There's a lot going on on the side, but we'll kind of break it down starting with hepatocellular carcinoma. And this is basically because you have abnormal tissue in the liver, you're eventually gonna have, um, or have be at risk for developing like malignant tissue in the liver. Um, so when a patient has cirrhosis, they have to go through like basically biannual screening with both an AFP blood test and ultrasound every six months. Um, if the screening comes back positive, so you see something like this uh, ultrasound image where there's like this big globule of like darkness here, uh, you'll get like better imaging like CT, um, which is usually do like quad basic CT or an MRI to kind of better assess what is, what is there in the liver that's going on. Uh, definitive treatment for this um, is like surgery, chemo, transplant is the definitive treatment completely. Um, you can do sometimes like temporary, uh, temporary measures like embolization or ablation, but again, at that point, you're getting involved, like your oncology doctors and everything like that. But it's really just an idea that, you know, patients who have cirrhosis are at risk for developing cancer. And that um, is one of the decompensations that we see in cirrhosis. The most common decompensation that you'll see is ascites. Uh, the pathway for this is pretty, uh, pathophysiology for this is kind of um, pretty straightforward. Uh, you have cirrhosis, you're going to have increased portal pressures in your portal system. So you get portal hypertension. When you have increased pressures in your portal system, you're going to start third spacing fluid. You're going to start pushing fluid out from your venous system into like places where fluid isn't supposed to be. And one of those spaces is like the peritoneal cavity of your abdomen. So you'll get people with ascites or fluid buildup in their abdomen. Um, and the way you can know that it's from cirrhosis is, you know, we tend to like denote this like um, serum, albumin, ascites, globulin gradient thing. Um, and basically at that gradient, your serum albumin uh, minus your acidic albumin is greater than 1.1. It's more likely to be cirrhosis. Um, if it's less than 1.1, it's more likely to be some sort of like infectious or malignant process. Um, if the acidic protein is very high, it can be like heart failure rather than like if the acidic protein is very low and it can be cirrhosis. The way we treat ascites is, um, like any kind of volume of lead state, we kind of salt restrict and we give them things that will make them urinate. So uh, diuretics like spironolactone and Lasix. Uh, generally, we give cirrhosis like spironolactone and Lasix. That's what all the trials have shown, but you can kind of give them anything that works for them. Anything that's going to make them urinate will be able to treat their ascites. If those don't work, we tend to go into more invasive measures like paracentesis, which is like basically putting a needle and a catheter into that uh, build up a fluid and kind of draining it manually. Um, large volume and small volume pairs, you know, people use them therapeutically to have these done. So like large volume is anything above five liters. Um, but 
Uh, most people, you know, will be good with two to three liters off. Um, if it becomes like a recurring problem, if like every month this person is coming in with ascites, you can kind of refer these patients to interventional radiology for a TIPS procedure, which basically means that they will like place a stunt between um, their portal system and their systemic venous system um, to drop uh, the pressures and reduce the amount of portal hypertension that the patient is suffering from. Um, and they're going to aim for a portal pressure gradient of less than 12. Um, yeah, this is for someone who's like coming in and, and again, not responding to diuretics and, you know, requiring like every day, every week, paracentesis. Um, great. The next decompensation uh, that was kind of touched on by Ramya is varices. Um, again, the pathophysiology of this is very similar. You have cirrhosis, you have people with high portal hypertension or high pressure gradients in their portal system, um, causing high pressure systems in their venous beds. One of those venous beds is going to be that of the variceal uh, venous beds, uh, um, or their esophageal venous bed, sorry. Um, again, when people bleed, like Rami mentioned, like the first step is to resuscitate. You give them blood, you give them blood products. Um, if you're giving them more than three units of blood, you're going to have to also give them platelets. You're also going to have to give them SRP. Um, and again, that's what we consider like a mass transfusion. Um, and then, you know, definitive treatment for these people is like scoping them, like uh, Rami mentioned. And again, like Rami mentioned, there's like different things that they can do in their uh, thermal coagulation, banding, et cetera. Um, when someone has like known varices, there's like a grading system to the varices, like grade one through four, I think. Um, and basically people who have like non-bleeding viruses that are at risk of bleeding, you want to prevent the bleeding uh, from happening by putting them on like low dose beta blockers, uh, non-selective beta blockers in particular. So that tends to be like something like carvedilol or propanolol. Um, the last um, sort of decompensation that someone can have when they get cirrhosis is encephalopathy. Um, again, the way this happens pathophysiology wise, um, you know, makes intuitive sense. You have cirrhosis, you have like impaired metabolism of ammonia, something that the liver normally is able to do, but because it has disease tissue now, it isn't able to do anymore. And when you have increased levels of ammonia, that causes, you know, altered mental status because you have a toxin in your system that's at a high at a elevated level. The way we kind of fix this is kind of like rudimentary. Uh, we give them things to make them um, kind of excrete their ammonia another way, which is through their bowel system. So we make them have three to five bowel movements a day. And the agent of choice tends to be lactulose, but anything, again, anything works. Um, Miralax, enemas, whatever they need to get those, get those three to five bowel movements a day. Um, if someone's having like recurrent episodes of this like hepatic encephalopathy where they're coming in, confused to the ED, it's happening more than once um, a month, like, at minimum, um, you can start other medications, uh, particularly rifaximin is one that you'll see people on. Um, and this can kind of help decrease ammonia as well um, through your um, series of rifaximin as well. Uh, we have different stages in cephalopathy. The only reason I mentioned this is because it was um, developed here in West Haven, uh, where all of us are training. Um, so there's stage one, which is like mild confusion all the way to stage four, which is um, coma, uh, not something they need to memorize necessarily if someone's confused and they have a history of cirrhosis, you know, second ammonia level is elevated, I would start, uh, start treating them with having them higher, having bowel movements. Uh, there's no real point to like trending the ammonia level over time. Um, once it's elevated, you know, at admission, just, you know, make them have bowel movements and until their mental status improves, like keep, keep titrating the, the lactulose up. Um, oops. one of the most kind of serious complications um, from those four decompensations is something called spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which is basically like an infection of the acidic fluid that builds up in your stomach. Um, the way these patients present is like this triad of like fever, like severe, severe abdominal pain. Like they're so uncomfortable, they cannot sit in the stretcher in the ED. Um, they're moving around, they're complaining of their abdominal pain, they're even slight bumps like to like the stretcher and not even touching their abdomen at all causes them to like jump out of bed. Um, so it's very, very severe abdominal pain as well as like altered mental status. Um, so in a patient with those three things, I get very, very concerned with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. That being said, about one in every six patients will basically not have any symptoms and still have spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So it should always kind of be on your differential for anyone who comes in with cirrhosis and has ascites. And you'll hear like, if someone has ascites and has cirrhosis, 
everyone gets a diagnostic error of stentesis to rule out SVP. And that's pretty standard of practice. It's shown to improve outcomes. So if you have patients that are coming in through the ED who haven't, who have ascites and it haven't, hasn't been tapped yet, that's kind of like your number one job to like kind of rule this out. Just because so many patients come in asymptomatic but still have this sort of complication going on. Um, kind of diagnostically, uh, you start treating people for this when they have like a fluid cell count above uh, a PMN count greater than 250. Um, but sometimes if people are so sick and it's so clinically obvious, I would like start treatment uh, um, before even the fluid cell count comes back for especially people who are having fever or abdominal ultramental status in this population of people. The treatment options are third, uh, third generation cephalosporins, uh, except for axone. Um, and then if people are really, really sick and have had multiple episodes of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, I kind of reach the carbapenems, um, and it's usually like a five-day course. Um, some special cases to kind of be aware of is like, you'll have like culture-negative nutrient-acidic patients or acidic fluid. Basically, like their PMN count is 250, but when you send it for culture, nothing grows. Still treat those patients. Um, you also have people with like a cell count of less than 250, but they, they have stuff growing on their cultures. Still treat those patients. Um, and then you'll have people who have like leukocytosis and it might like, they might not have any abdominal pain, but they maybe have like another infection. But you, when you do the paracentesis, their PMN count is above 250. Still treat those patients. In these three like special cases, it's shown to improve outcomes, even if it doesn't like clinically make sense um, or they don't have all the clinical signs and symptoms of SBP. Um, people who have multiple episodes of SBP, um, we like, tend to recommend prophylaxis either with like Bactrim or Cipro. And these um, indications are like obviously with someone with prior SVP, uh, people with like cirrhosis and ascites with acidic protein levels greater, less than 1.5 and creatinine greater than 1.5, 1.2. And like any cirrhosis with like a history of a GI bleed, we're also very concerned about. And we'll start prophylaxis in those patients as well. On the shifting topics, um, away from the liver stuff, back into like more a little bit of basic internal medicine and how to interpret ABGs. I kind of, one of my favorite things is to interpret ABGs. So um, it's kind of, it's very like step process and algorithmic. Um, you start with like what you get in ABGs, like you get your pH. Um, then you get your partial pressure of CO2 and your partial pressure of oxygen. And you also get like a calculated uh, bicarb, like your serum bicarb. Um, the ones that you need to focus on for like this diagnostic approach is like the pH as well as the partial pressure of uh, CO2. Basically, if you're less than 7.4, think yourself as acetemic. If you're greater than 7.4, think yourself as alkalotic. Um, if you have a CO2 that is less than 40, think of yourself as having a metabolic acidosis uh, when you're acidemic. And if you have a CO2 greater than 40, think yourself as having a metabolic alkalosis. Uh, a respiratory alkalosis, sorry. Um, and then on the opposite side, if you have an alkalosis, pH, alkalotic pH, and your CO2 is greater than 40, think yourself as having a metabolic alkalosis, and a CO2 less than 40 is a respiratory alkalosis. The metabolic alkalosis, acidosis, is important to always calculate an anion gap, which is basically adding up your sodium um, and subtracting your bicarb and subtracting your Chloride, and if it's greater than 12, you have an anion gap metabolic acidosis. And if it's less than 12, you have non anion gap metabolic acidosis. All that being said, it's probably more important to like understand what the differential is for each of these like acid based diseases. So, starting with uh, respiratory acidosis, very often this is because like what we do to patients. So, we like high, when patients are like having pure respiratory acidosis and they're on ventilators, it's because we're likely hypoventilating them. Other things that can cause hypoventilation, like neuromuscular disease and opioids, um, is also like on the differential. But again, it'll be like part of the history. Someone's come in taking opioids or someone's come in um, having like a history of a neuromuscular disease. Um, I would again say something similar to respiratory alkalosis. This is something usually that we do to people. Um, we hyperventilate them on ventilators or, you know, they have a history of CNS disease. It's also important to know that like people who are Pregnant are going to always be a little bit alkalotic um, and have a baseline respiratory alkalosis. Uh, the two more kind of common uh, acid base disturbances uh, that we kind of deal with um, is like an anion gap metal block acidosis and a non anion gap metal block acidosis. Um, highly urged to have this like kind of like 
memorize and go through this differential anytime you see these disturbances. Uh, so for anion gap, I still, to this day, use mud piles and still go through the differential of mud piles. Um, and as you guys, I'm sure, have you know, at some point read through, it's uh, methanol, uremia, DKA, propanol glycol, iron, lactic acidosis, ethanol, glycol, and salphalates. Um, in the absence of kind of like any exogenous or people in the hospital most likely get, it's usually somewhere in between uremia, DKA, and lactic acidosis. So making sure you're checking those three things on most inpatients is kind of important. Uh, for the non-anion gap, uh, it really comes down to GI losses um, and RTAs. So, like, all these things have to do with, like, GI, GU losses, losing chloride somewhere uh, or getting extra chloride. Um, so, like, diarrhea, pancreatic fistulas, small bowel fistulas, urinary diversion, these are all GI losses that are going to cause your um, cause you to have a non-anion gap, metabolic acidosis. RTAs also cause this um, and are usually, like, a, like, when I go down through things, is like, a uh, diagnosis of exclusion. For metabolic alkalo alkalosis, it's GI, it's GI losses like through the mouth. So like vomiting, GI suctioning, or like urinary losses through diuretics. So like either like someone's on Lasix and they're getting a metabolic alkalosis or they're on some other sort of diuretic like a thiazide or Fumex or something. Also like um, congenital diseases like Barter syndrome, Gittleman syndrome, Little syndrome, which all like basically work like diuretics. Often also cause you to have a metabolic alkalosis as well. Uh, so usually acid-based disturbances don't happen in like in, as like one entity. They usually like have concomitant disorders with them. So the way to figure that out is through a bunch of math. Uh, so like when someone has a metabolic acidosis, I'm sure you guys all have heard of Winter's formula. Here's kind of the formula um, in its entirety. And basically, if someone has a PCO2 that's like greater than what is expected, you probably have a concomitant metabolic uh, respiratory acidosis. If it's less than expected, respiratory alkalosis. If it's equal to what's expected, you probably have some sort of normal compensation of what's going on. Uh, there's also a formula for metabolic alkalosis, uh, but something that I wanna just point out uh, very quickly from this slide and kind of get the most important out of is that when you have someone with like, who's coming in with like hypercapnia, someone who has a high level of PCO2, you wanna know if it's chronic or acute. And the way you do this is that if you have a PCO2 partial that's normal at 40 and any every 10, uh, 10 points above 40, um, the pH changes by 0.03, it's likely chronic. If it changes by 0.08, it's likely acute. Um, so if someone has a PCO2 of, um, 50 and their pH is 7.32, it's likely like an acute change of what's happening in the respiratory status. If it's 7.37, it's likely a chronic change to what's happening in the system. And that's kind of the big takeaway of understanding like acute versus chronic respiratory issues. Um, great. Now we're gonna just quickly talk about antibiotics. Um, I think antibiotics are like just kind of a tough thing to like get your hold on because there's just, I think as a medical student, I was, it was more just like rote memorization. Uh, but I think it's a little bit of understanding like what each class of antibiotics covers and what they don't cover. And I just want to point out on this chart some kind of big patterns that are, I think are important to understand when like when someone comes in with an infection, like what to prescribe them. Um, so for, Gram positive, like look at MRSA. On the MRSA column, there's only like two or three things that cover MRSA, and it's Bank, Bactrim, and Quinta. Um, otherwise, like most of your other gram positive infections are gonna be covered by like your cephalosporins, your penicillins, um, and your like monobacterians. Um, and then the other one that I wanna say is Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is really only covered by a few different things. Third and fourth, uh, or fourth generation cephalosporins, your Zosin, your Cipro, and your aminoglycosides. So if you have a patient that's concerned about having a pseudomonal infection, think of these three things, uh, these three classes of antibiotics. If you're concerned of someone with a respiratory infection, the only thing that covers atypical respiratory infections are your uh, levofloxacin, your moxifloxacin, your zithromycin, and doxy. Um, so when you're treating someone for community-acquired pneumonia, make sure you have one of these as well for covering atypical sides. Um, and then broadly, like these are the main infections to kind of treat when you've 
or these are the main antibiotics to treat because you're looking like you're targeting organisms rather than like targeting certain infections. So for meningitis, these are like an adult population, that organism that you're going to see. And, you know, start everyone broadly on subtracts on Banco AMP. For CAP, again, you want that atypical coverage plus your kind of gram positive coverage with cefotraxone. If they have some sort of hospital like exposure, prodding them to Piptazo and Vanco to cover that MRSA and Pseudomonas is really important. And for abdominal infections, most of them can be covered by cefotraxone and methanidazole, or even Zosin alone will cover most uh, for abdominal infections. UTIs, I'm really a big fan of, you know, in the hospital, starting broadly with like a third generation. Cephalosporin, and then when you get into like this endocarditis and um, osteomyelitis, making sure you have MRSA coverage with vancomycin is extremely important. And finally, kind of my favorite topic and something that's like I have a little bit of a passion for is like how to run a code. Um, I think these are highly stressful situations, so having like an idea of what to do when you get into the room is super important. I like recommend kind of uh, having you know, an idea of how you want to go do like run a code when you're in that situation before getting in that situation. And these are some of my kind of tips and tricks. Um, kind of the basics, like be loud, introduce yourself, make sure everyone knows like you're going to be the person when you walk into a code that's leading it. Um, and then assign roles. Uh, like the uh, AHA has these like six person high performance teams that they recommend doing, but basically like you pick someone who's the leader, which is likely going to be you as a doctor. Like someone who's going to be a timer, usually going to be like an, another co-resident or another doctor that's in the room. RT is going to be controlling the airway. Have a nurse be someone in charge of giving the meds. Have at least a few people who are going to do chest compressions and have one person that's going to be checking your pulse. You know, in these situations, you want to make sure that this person is full code before you go down this pathway. But usually when you, by the time you get there as, you know, the medical doctor, someone has already done this. But again, when you get there, just confirm that someone has done this by the time you get there. The three things I make sure when I walk into a room that I start with before thinking about anything else is, this, is there a backboard? Making sure we have good compressions with the backboard in place. Second, are the pads on the patient? Are the defibrillator pads on the patient? And do we have adequate access or do we need more access for the patient to give medications? Um, and then, you know, these are things to think about, but, you know, make sure that you have someone that's outside of the room and not like with hands on the directly on the patient to call the primary team and call the family to let them know what's going on. The algorithm for ACLS is gonna get you through like any situation that you can. And the algorithm is really based on like what works and what's been shown to work for the patients and what's gonna help the patient the most. So it's gonna start with getting good, adequate chest compressions. Because CPR is the thing that's been shown to save people's lives the most. Making sure as a leader that the person doing chest compression is doing them correctly is part of your job as, you know, as a team leader in, in, in a code situation. Second, your second job is, you know, making sure you can identify rhythm. So on those two minute sort of rhythm checks, identifying the rhythm can help, you know, get someone into a shock. Because when you're able to have a shockable rhythm, that person is most more likely to get ROSC. Um, so being able to assess what looks, what is VFib, what is VTAG, and, you know, providing adequate and timely shock is gonna more have a more likely chance for that patient to get ROS, get back a pulse, um, and allow to, you know, continue care. Um, PA and assistily are not shockable rhythms. Um, and unfortunately these patients do worse. So making sure you're able to differentiate between uh, you know VTAC and VFID from PA and asystole is very important. Um, the third thing is delivering epi. So every uh, four Three to four minutes is the recommendation in this pathway to like deliver epi. Again, and as your team leader, you're the one asking for that pain. You're the one asking to deliver it. So making sure you have someone who's timing for you and telling you, hey, it's been three or four minutes. Can we give it, you know, and then it's your job to you know, tell the team that, you know, we need to give another good epi. Because um, these are the three things, CPR, delivering shock, and giving epi are the three things that, you know, are going to, you know, get people off and have them have a higher mortality rate out of this, or lower mortality rate. Um, there's other stuff in the stuff and the code cards that you kind of should be aware of and things that can help. Um, you know, there's amio, uh, atryptamine, uh, atropine, sodium bicarb, calcium chloride, um, lidocaine, you know, mag. These things are, you know, can be helpful in certain situations, but again, it's really epi shocks and compressions that save lives. Um, these other things are kind of adjuvants and kind of help, can help like differentiating things when you have a better differential of like the H's and T's. Um, so, Again, going through the H&Ts is like something to do as a code leader, 
uh, once you have like a good rhythm of what's going on in the code. Um, and you cannot, it doesn't have to be by yourself. It can be with everyone else in the room, but going through this list of the causes of um, cardiac arrest is very important. So is the person volume down? Were they hypoxic? Do they have an acidosis? Um, do they have like an issue with their um, potassium? Or is there something else going on? Is there some, is this an MI, a PE, is it tension pneumo, trauma, et cetera? Um, and running through this differential, you know, after you, you know, somewhat gotten a few minutes into the code is very important to kind of help you deliver some other medications or some under um, interventions to kind of get this person back into ROSC. Um, the big takeaways is, you know, assert yourself, um, assign roles, um, follow the algorithm. Again, prioritizing chest compressions, FB and shocking is the big thing. And then when you're communicating with everyone, making sure that they, you know, they understand what is going on and having closed loop communications with the other members in the team is really important in these kind of high stress situations. And then asking for help. Yeah, I think it's like the biggest thing you can do is that, look, um, you know, you guys are going to be like first, second year residents interns doing these codes and, you know, nurses that have been doing this for years and years longer than I've been alive, you know, have a lot of experience can be very helpful in these situations. So definitely lean on them and lean on people's experiences for these, in these situations. You don't have to be alone. Um, an app that I like is the full uh, code pro app. Um, got a good timer, helps you keep track of everything and highly recommend it. Um, with that, kind of go on to Dr. Garamella. Okay, two seconds to share my screen. Let's see. All right. Um, Hopefully that looks okay for everybody. Um, all right, so my name is Sanju. I'm gonna try to be as expedited as I possibly can because I know that we're getting close to the six o'clock mark. Um, let me just, oh, there's a question. Um, maybe we can answer the questions on the actual chat if that's okay. Um, Sorry, Dr. Caramella, it's just that we see your um, presenter mode. Uh -huh. it's, it's visible, but if you want to, for the interest of time, you can proceed and we see it fine that's helpful that's really helpful um there's really no notes there so but let me just change it to the other way let's see i'm so sorry you guys we if you could believe it we did practice screen sharing um okay that's probably better all right so like i said we're going to try to be expedited as much as possible so um, the first one's an AFib talk, and um, just imagine, you know, you're in in your workroom, you get called to the ED, you hear about this patient who um, has a history of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, OSA, um, and she's coming in with a one-hour uh, one history of palpitations. The rest of her review systems is fairly unremarkable. So then um, you look through the chart and you see this initial EKG, which is notable um, for like an irregularly irregular rhythm. And so because you've already studied for step one and two, you know this looks very similar to what you would consider as AFib. So at this point, it's kind of important to just step back and actually classify um, AFib in terms of when it was detected, if this is new versus recurrent. Um, and the way that we classify currently is there's like four different classifications. So there's um, the extreme on one side, which is permanent AFib. And this is in which um, rhythm control interventions have been attempted for more than a year and it's not successful. And then you have your recurrent AFib. So you have paroxysmal, which is like less than a week, persistent, which is more than a week, and then longstanding persistent, which is greater than a year. Um, okay. So when you do have a suspicion for AFib, um, the first thing you do is try to get your like frame of reference of why they have it and what you need to order. So the EKG, we just went over the regularly irregular, just diving down into it. It's um, specifically, there's not necessarily any distinguishable P waves and you don't have to see like the FIB part of it, but um, I think the lack of the P waves is what's most helpful. And then the ventricular rate can vary greatly. And so you would call it rate controlled versus um, not rate controlled. 
Um, just but for the sake of this talk, we're not going to go into like etiologies and epidemiology of AFib, but for the most part, um, there's the normal workup that you would do, including a CBC, um, CMP, and TSH. And this is to look for any kind of infectious etiology that might have triggered the AFib, um, to see if there's any light derangements that triggered it, or if it's a hyperthyroidism issue. Um, you can also order a chest x-ray to see if there's any abnormalities in the actual thorax, and then cardiac biomarkers to see if there's any stress on the heart um, that's precluding the, um, I guess, resolution of AFib because you got to fix the problem. And then the one thing to always remember with AFib is this is a stressor. And so if there's something else underlying like a PE, for example, that can also um, cause AFib. All right, so there's a lot on the slide. And then again, like I said, for time, I'm gonna try to go quickly. So I apologize if it's rushed, but if there's a certain question, our chat um, is open. We've got a lot of future cardiologists who are happy to help slash current cardiologists. So um, starting with risk assessment and figuring out you know, is there something that is accept making this AFib happen? So if someone has a significant light derangement or hyperthyroidism, you're not really going to fix the AFib until you fix that underlying issue and you want to do it aggressively. And then the first actual branch point is stable or unstable. And so I don't know if you see my um, cursor, but it's under like the box A. And if a patient's unstable, um, you want to cardiovert. That's kind of the first thing you do because there's nothing... There's no other risk than just being unstable. But if they're not unstable, you start thinking about their history and what to do next. So for whatever reason, they're already on anticoagulation and they have been for more than three weeks, you can rhythm control them. And this can be either chemically through like amiodarone or you can do a cardioversion electrically. But if they're not on anticoagulation, this is the first time they're coming in, um, it's less likely they're, they have any history of anticoagulation. You look at their history to see if they've had prior strokes. Um, if not, or any TIAs, um, then you can kind of look into the second pathway, which I'll get to. But if they have had a history of this, you just wanna go straight to rate control and then you can figure things out later. If they have not, then you look at how long they've had um, the AFib. So if it's a short duration of time, so it's like less than 12 hours, which for our patient, which was only an hour of symptoms, you can assume that the AFib was only for an hour. It's safe to rhythm control. But if not, then you want to maybe go down the path of the TEE, and then you can decide to rate control or rhythm control. Under the rate and rhythm control, so rate control, we often use beta blockers as our first line. We can also use calcium channel blockers. And then um, you can add on digoxin. Um, rarely is it used, but it's a medication that is available. And then rhythm control, like I said, you can cardiovert or you can use any kind of um, pharmacologic agent. So um, oftentimes we use amiodarone. And then the second part of this is whether you want to anticoagulate or not. And so um, in all patients with any non-valvular um, AFib, so you, and that's like the three categories, it's like the, you know, paroxysmal persistent or permanent, um, you look at whether or not you should start anticoagulation. <clears throat> so we use two scoring systems. We use the chads Basque and the Hazlitt score, which I'll go into in a second. Um, for both of those scoring systems, if they're on the ends of the spectrum, so they're really low risk, chads Basque, or really high risk, has blood, you want to reconsider whether you want to um, anticoagulate. But for the vast majority of patients, they land in the middle and you do anticoagulate. And oftentimes we use um, DOAX, so like Eliquis or Xarelto, which is a Pixaban and Rivaroxaban. Um, and we can also use Warfarin. And then um, in terms of the actual scoring systems, um, we have the chads Basque, which I already mentioned, and the has blood. So the chads Basque is to see the risk of stroke. And for patients, we kind of delineate between um, male and female. And so just being a female gives you a point. So for someone who's scoring zero or one points, you, it's just a risk benefit conversation, but two or three points, you do want to absolutely start um, anticoagulation. And then the Hazlitt score. So technically above three is um, a reason to um, maybe hold off on any kind of anticoagulation. However, it's not a clear cut thing. So if someone scores high on the has blood, there's still no actual like, rationale to not anticoagulate. You just wanna be more judicious with follow-up. Okay, that's AFib. Now we're gonna switch gears really rapidly 
to dyspnea and hypoxia, which honestly, for me personally, I think in residency in the last three years, this is like the one thing I've seen the most often because it's like in the palm world, you see it in cirrhosis and like liver clinic, you see it in um, cards. And so hopefully this is helpful. So just definitions wise, dyspnea itself is a sensation, but there's not necessarily like an objective finding. Hypoxia is the actual objective data. And so you would want to look at the um, PaO2 and then the SaO2. So, and they both are like the pulse ox versus what you actually see in the blood. Um, and they're helpful to discern if someone's hypoxic or not. So in this case, it's a 53-year-old gentleman with a history of hypertension, CAD, half rough with an EF of 35%. Admitted two days ago for worsening lower extremity edema, shortness of breath, weight gain over the past week. And so it all kind of looks like acute decompensated heart failure. Started with diuresis, um, with pretty good effect. And then you're on nights as you do as an intern, you get a call about, um, you know, getting routine vitals, the pulse ox is showing 84%. So you go to his bedside and you see that um, he's tachypnic with increased work of breathing. The question now is what do you do next? Because there's a couple of things you want to check before you actually work. So the idea of it is assess and act. So you um, want to do your ABCs, which is, um, I think Arsh might have talked about, but it's like in terms of airway and breathing. And then um, you want to repeat the vitals. And this is something you can ask the nurse to do as you walk over, right? So by the time you get there, you have a fresh set of vitals to make sure everything was actually accurate. You want to look at the actual um, waveform. So this is something that I learned in residency, but there's, you know, the signal itself could be poor. And so you can see on the right image, a normal signal has that kind of up and down pattern, but a low perfusion signal seems a little bit flatter. The normal signal I would trust, the one below I wouldn't. And then you place the patient on supplemental oxygen um, and we'll get into the different types of supplemental oxygen. But the most important thing is just figuring out, do you need help or not? So in this situation, right, you're the night intern cross covering, um, I would recommend just for everybody, if any kind of vitals are changing, I would recommend calling your senior resident if they're around. So you would let them know, hopefully they're at your bedside as well. And then the question is who else you call? So um, at Yale, we, and you know, most other hospitals, um, there's a rapid response team. And so this is a team of nurses, um, really, really highly trained nurses. So they're very, very good. Um, the respiratory therapist comes, a on-call attending hospitalist comes. Um, I think those are the big ones. And so for the rapid response team, you have more hands on deck. You can also call overhead for anesthesia to come to bedside in case you think this is a situation where a patient's gonna rapidly decompensate and you need airway access. And then sometimes, depending on each hospital, you need to call the MICU depending on what kind of oxygen you start. So again, at Yale, we are only really allowed to use up to four liters on nasal cannula. Once you get to six liters on nasal cannula, people get a little worried unless there's clear documentation why. And past six liters, we have to step them up to either the step-down unit or the ICU. And then in assessing and acting, you also wanna look at etiologies. And so you can order a chest X-ray, get a blood gas, um, and then you can consider you know, is there a metabolic reason someone is maybe trying to compensate? If you looked at Arsha's talk, um, there's reasons to compensate for acid-based disturbances, and so you might want to get a BMP as well. And then if you have access to ultrasound, you want to do a bedside focus and echo, which this year we're not going over that, but it, it's something that you'll learn about in residency about the importance of doing that. Um, so then once you're kind of in a, a field of the big stuff part of it, you can actually start thinking about what's going on. So you wanna think about cardiovascular, home, and other issues. And so it's easy in my mind to just have buckets. Um, the cardiovascular causes of like dyspnea is in terms of the myocardium itself, the pericardium, and then any kind of electrical conduction. And you know, you guys can read and see what falls under each bucket. And then you can also have palm issues. And so this is looking at the actual airways, vasculature, looking at like any ideas for VQ mismatch and then looking at the surrounding. So the parenchyma, the pleura, and then alveolar, if anything surrounding it or inside of it. Um, and oftentimes for history purposes, you would be able to figure out, you know, which bucket is most likely causing this new um, hypoxia. And then there's other, like a little bit less common issues. So chest wall, neuromuscular and hematologic, as well as just other. Um, I would say at night, specifically when people have oxygen sats that suddenly drop, but then when they wake up, it goes up again, 
like OSA is very, very, very common and it's often untreated. So folks might not be on CPAP at home or even know they have OSA, but when they're in the hospital, they start um, becoming, you know, hypoxic for whatever reason. And that's something you would have to problem solve, but they typically don't feel it as much. So um, that's kind of the rationale. And then the last kind of bit that I want to talk about is just what is oxygen? Because honestly, I don't think I understood anything past nasal cannula when I was at least starting intern year. Um, so nasal cannula is our base type of oxygen. It gives you about two to six liters per minute and has an FiO2 of 25 to 40%. Past that, we have a simple face mask that covers the entirety of the face. And this can go up to 10 liters of oxygen per minute. And then the Ventura mask, which is similar, which I'm not going to go into. Um, we, we also have the non-rebreather. And so this has a um, area where you could ha you kind of have like oxygen sitting there and it's 10 to 15 liters. So it's a little bit higher, but the most important part is your FiO2 is significantly increased from your nasal cannula. It's 80 to 90%. So there's quite an improvement in patient symptoms between the nasal cannula and the non-rebreather. And then you have a high flow nasal cannula, which looks honestly just like a nasal cannula, just everything appears to be thicker, but that flow is high. It's 30 to 60 liters per minute. And you, had a, you can go up to 100% FiO2. Um, the other thing that you hear a lot about is PEEP, and that's your positive expiratory airway pressure, um, exhalation pressure. And that one is important to keep your alveolar act alveoli actually plump and open. The high flow nasal cannula doesn't prevent a, provide a whole lot of PEEP, but it does have a little bit. So if you're trying to keep the airway patent, it can give you a tiny bit. But what really does keep your um, airways open are your non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So that's your CPAP and your BiPAP, and of course, ultimately, if you intubate. So this is a review slide, and I think just for time purposes, I'm not going to go over this because I kind of went over everything, but when you guys get the slides after you fill out the survey, um, you'll be able to follow this pretty simply. Okay, switching gears to heart failure. Um, so this one also, it's, I mean, something that you see very often, especially decompensated heart failure. So in heart failure, you have, it's essentially, you know, your heart isn't pumping, and that can be divided up into two different categories. So you have low cardiac output heart failure and high cardiac output heart failure. And I think for me personally, I didn't really understand the idea of high cardiac output failure because it just seems like it's working, but it's really, um, there's just more need. And so there's an increased demand and the heart's pumping harder just because of the metabolic need. We, to be honest, we don't see a whole lot of like pregnancy in our patients or like, um, anemia to that extent that you have high output cardiac um, heart failure, but AV malformation, hypothyroid, hyperthyroidism I have seen, and oftentimes this is in the CCU that you have this high cardiac output heart failure. The more common is the left side of the screen of the low cardiac output heart failure. And that's just um, a prevention of increased function with any kind of exertion. So then it's the delineation between right-sided and left-sided heart failure. So um, starting with right-sided heart failure, this one can kind of like fly under the radar a little bit more because patients just feel not well, um, but you can't often see why that's the case. So um, edema is certainly possible, lower extremity edema and ascites, but oftentimes patients have so much backup that they just feel nauseous and just unwell. Um, and then the most common cause of right-sided heart failure, you'll learn, everyone will pimp you on this on the wards, is left-sided heart failure, but just lung disease as a whole can also cause right-sided heart failure. The other side is left-sided heart failure, which is quite common as well, and this is what we think about in terms of hef ref and hef pef um, and this is much more symptomatic, but it's pretty overt, so poor exercise tolerance, dyspnea, P&D. Um, and you delineate this based on the actual EF, and I have another slide coming up that can help delineate, but it helps with discerning if it's, a, you know, hef breath tends to be a more systolic issue, hef pef is more diastolic, though there's a little bit of overlap there, and then you have your rationale for why that could be um, contributing. So the other way to delineate heart failure is based on the um, New York Heart Association classes, NYJ, one through four. And we use this in conjunction as with like the other type of um, heart failure 
delineation, which is based on the EF, to see how much the heart failure affects patient's symptoms, as well as just where the ejection fraction of the LV is. And so we have um, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, and then heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But people can, you know, have like an MI, drop their EF, and then over time bring it up again. And in those patients, and this is kind of newer in the last five-ish years, the idea of heart failure with recovered ejection fraction, that history of a prior low EF is actually important in terms of what medications you decide to start. So um, again, just based on time, I'm not gonna go too much into this, but there's the forward failure, which is when there's just decreased perfusion moving forward. And so that's when patients kind of feel woozier. Um, and it's like a little bit altered, nausea is just like unwell. And then backward is pretty obvious. You have the edema, shortness of breath, kind of everything that we're normally used to seeing. Um, so in terms of physical exam, I think this helps a lot with just deciding what kind of heart failure patients have. Um, I don't know if there's any people of Indian origin, but oftentimes in Indian culture, you're told to like touch people's feet as a way of like getting blessings. And I remember my intern year, my chief resident who was from India had told me that's really important to always get blessings from your patients. And he was joking, but also basically saying that when you walk into the room and you're nervous about heart failure, touching people's peripheries, whether it's their hands or their feet can give you so much information and it helps you, you know, categorize what class they're in. So the minute I walk into a patient's room as I'm talking to them, I'll kind of examine, especially if they're decompensating, you want to like lift the blanket off and just look at what their feet are looking like because it helps decide are they warm or cold and are they wet or dry. And again, you can see kind of the classification, but it's really helpful for even understanding what the likelihood of mortality is because that cold and wet class has a really high mortality and it's important to act upon that pretty quickly. Um, and then for decompensation, there's this is kind of a mnemonic from Gosmosis, which I'm sure some of you have studied from, from during med school. Um, but this is kind of a way to remember why people can decompensate. I think the most common in my patients and what we see is L, lifestyle. So, you know, after Thanksgiving, when there's a huge salt load, that's when people can decompensate. Um, if they just go on vacation or they're not drinking enough water, drinking too much alcohol, those kinds of things really contribute. Um, okay, so that is the kind of decompensation part. And then just in terms of workup, which I think can also be helpful, as you've noticed probably in the last two and a half hours, it's the same lab, so we check all the time, right? So your CBC, CMP. But in this case, it's important to discern if there's so little flow that you don't have any end or that you have end organ damage. Um, you also want to just see the stress on the heart in terms of like the actual BNP. And then it's more to get a lactate to just see, again, in that end organ, end organ damage category. Um, if they have chest pain, get a trope as usual. And then you can also get um, imaging studies done. This can be a chest x-ray to look for any fluid. And this can be fluid anywhere, right, in terms of um, outside the lungs. So I'm saying like pleural effusion or inside the lungs pulmonary edema. Um, EKG, obviously, which we don't have to talk about why. Um, and then if you have your ultrasound, you yourself could do a bedside echo and you can look at the lungs yourself. You can look at the heart yourself to see how the EF is squeezing, or you can, you know, type in on Epic to get a um, TTE done or whatever your, you know, mode of ordering things is. And then finally, it's the actual purpose of getting a heart catheterization. So if you think it's an ischemic etiology of heart failure, you definitely want to um, get a left heart cath to see if that's what's causing the heart failure. So then lastly is just the management. It's, I mean, most often than not, it's diuresis. So if someone's already on a diuretic, you double what they have and make it IV. But if they're Lasix naive is what we say, which just means they've never you know, been diuresed before, not often, um, you do IV Lasix 40. So that's kind of the first order you put in. Decide if they need any oxygen, supplemental oxygen, and then figure out which medications should be held. Because if they're in such a florid state of heart failure that their um, blood pressure starts dropping, you might wanna stop you know, some of those antihypertensives and the beta blockers. And notably, you want to hold off on any calcium channel blockers. And then occasionally, but not like infrequently, you might need um, presser support for diuresis. And so at that point, you might need to go to the um, ICU setting. 
Okay, last one. We can power through. We got this. This one is probably the most complicated thing, and you will certainly not walk away feeling you know this because I still don't know it, but I hope that this will help you get a framework. It's only a couple slides, but the first thing is hyponatremia. It's not a salt issue. It's a water issue. And honestly, like keep track of how many times your attendings tell this to you over the next three years, because you, you know, I'm guessing it's going to be at least 25 times. Um, all right. The clinical approach. So what it breaks down to, because I'm about to show you a slide that's going to make you want to throw up because there's so much information on it. But the bottom line is you assess what your patient's volume status is. That's really history. Assess osmolality, that's a lab, and then look at the P. Figure out how much sodium or if you diuresed them for whatever reason, how much urea has come out. And the three things together will help you figure out what's going on with their sodium level. That's it. Okay, now putting it into practice. So hyponatremia, we define as a sodium less than 135, and you can either calculate the serum osmolality or you can order it. Um, depending on the lab, those numbers shift a little bit in terms of what's normal, but typically 280 to 285. And that's your um, kind of goal definition of what os a normal osmolality is. So the first one I'm going to talk about is a hypertonic. So this is when your osmolality is greater than 285. As it says, right, like you have high tonicity, and this is when the solutes in your blood are actually osmotically active. So you have toxins in there, there's a ton of glucose floating around, or you're super, super uremic. And that kind of makes sense, right? Like you're looking at that formula and it's sodium, glucose, and BUN. So if you have too much glucose or too much BUN, it can look like the sodium part of it is actually low, um, which may or may not be the case. So that one's pretty straightforward, hopefully. The next one is the isotonic hyponatremia. So these are, um, osms that are not actually that active. So things like lipids and proteins. And so for any reason, someone has super high lipids, familiar hypertriglyceridemia, or there's a lot of protein for whatever reasons, typically malignancy related, that can also cause your sodium to look falsely low just because there's so much other stuff floating around, right? And so those are the two that you see, I would say a little bit less frequently. This middle chunk is probably the vast majority of why you're going to think about hyponatremia. So your osms are less than 280, so you have a hypotonic hyponatremia. The first step, remember I said you got to figure out volume status, and this you do just by looking at your patient and talking to them. You know, someone who hasn't eaten in 10 days, they're probably hypovolemic. Someone who looks really dry, has dry mucous membranes, all of these are ways that you can decide if they're hypovolemic for whatever reason. And then you also can check their urine because... Um, for some reason, kidney doctors love pee. So that will also help you decide how well the RAS and aldosterone systems are working. Okay, so let's say they're euvolemic. And this is typically when the urine sodium is above 20. Um, you look at the osms. And so the, if they're putting out a lot of osms, which means that they're not putting a lot of water, right? They're kind of concentrated, the actual urine. The causes of this, there's like a mnemonic, there are rats. I would say the most common cause that I see all the time is SIADH. And so oftentimes our patients in the hospital have pain for whatever reason, because they're in the hospital. They can very often precipitate, or pain can very often precipitate hyponatremia and SIADH. And in that situation, you want to fluid restrict, maybe give them urea or salt tabs, which taste horrible, but could help. And you may do Baptans, but notably it's not FDA approved. So that's off label and that can be what you and your attending do. Or you could have urine osms less than a hundred. And that means it's really dilute urine. And the most common ones are the tea and toast diet, which means that people are just simply not eating enough or chronically low solute intake. So this could be like the beer potomania. So that's the middle part, which I feel like hopefully is straightforward. The other two are pretty simple as well, I promise. So hypervolemic, right? They just look puffy for whatever reason. They've got a lot of fluid on board. So it's either renal or extra renal. Um, I'll start with the renal side of it, renal failure. Basically, they're just not excreting well. Done. Extra renal. So these um, are good. Yes. 507, 906. Okay. Um, so, sorry, I thought I heard a question or something. Okay, so then extra renal, you have um, 
heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome. So these are all reasons that your urine sodium would be on the lower side. And in this situation, you diurese, so you try to get rid of all that extra fluid. And then the last one is the hypovolemic. And so this is just some sort of losses, right? Either they, if their urine sodium is low, which means that the body's trying super hard to like hold on to the sodium, that means that they're losing some solute in some way. They're vomiting, they have di diarrhea, they have dehydration or just insensible losses. In that situation, you give them fluid. Or they have some sort of renal injury. And so maybe they're taking a lot of diuretics or they have an AKI. So the actual like tubules aren't functioning to actually hold on to the sodium properly. That could be another case. In both of those, you give them fluids. Um, I want to highlight that if anyone has a symptomatic hyponatremia, you give them 3% saline, and that's done typically in the ICU setting. This is, again, another one of those slides you can look at when you get the slide deck, um, but it's the same picture, which is like a little bit more simplified. Okay, that is all. Um, hopefully that was speedy. Thank you.